Uh, hi everyone, Big Thinny Drop Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a review, a classic review, in fact, of this Herbie Hancock album, Headhunters. Yep, this is the 1973 album from keyboardist, piano player, and band leader Herbie Hancock and his band uh, that he formed at the time, uh, Headhunters. A man who cut his teeth on the jazz circuit in the 60s, uh, diving headfirst into hard bop, post-bop, modal jazz, sometimes avant-garde jazz. You could say he hit the ground running, especially considering uh, that he played a pivotal role in some of the most adventurous recordings of Miles Davis from the mid to late 60s, like Nefertiti, for example. And Hancock was also there uh, for this pivotal transitional moment moving into the early 70s that saw jazz music embracing more electric instrumentation, fusing the genre with elements of rock and funk and a host of other things. You can actually catch Herbie's fantastic playing on groundbreaking recordings such as In a Silent Way. But during this time period, he was also recording his own material and beginning to venture into this new movement for improvisational music himself. And this coincided with a lot of changes for Hancock at the time. He had just moved over to Warner Brothers Records. His first release with them was an album of uh, music recorded for the Fat Albert NBC special that essentially preceded the television series. And while in one respect you could see this album as a bit of a popular media novelty. It's still a great and funky album with a lot of great improvisations that did, I'm sure, help at least a little bit uh, set a much funkier course for Herbie's music into the immediate future. These jazz fusion and funk styles would go on to define Herbie's next several records, though uh, they were much more experimental and out there by comparison, especially the often overlooked Sex Tent, which has uh, some fantastic electronic and synth passages on it uh, that were pretty groundbreaking for the time. But even in the midst of making all of this new and exciting jazz, uh, Herbie's restlessness uh, was pushing him to change things up even further, because I guess what he was doing at the time just wasn't funky enough, possibly too abstract, and uh, getting to where he wanted to be required him to reform his band into an outfit known as Headhunters, which is still active to this day, uh, sans Herbie Hancock. They just put out an album like in 2022. But this 1973 record over here would be Herbie's debut with the new group, with also this new tweaked direction, and it has withstood the test of time as one of the most significant contributions to uh, jazz funk and jazz fusion ever. And for good reason, because the four tracks on this thing contain some of the most funky and grooving bass lines, beats, and keyboard licks you'll hear in your life. For for a jazz record, there are just unique levels of tone, melodic flavor, and cartoonish camp here, combined with an experimental, slightly playful, kind of goofster attitude that I think makes Headhunters uh, more accessible than many of the self-serious jazz rock jams that you find on a lot of fusion records. Because while a lot of artists, even Miles himself, uh, were borrowing from the uh, groove blueprint of funk music, often what would not carry over was was the fun, exuberant, wild vibes that uh, were laced into those formative funk records. But here on Headhunters, it most certainly does. And yet, it still functions as a serious display of band chemistry and jazz chops. There are four tracks on this record, ranging from six to 15 minutes each, and every one is an iconic jam in its own right. From that slinky, kind of fuzzy envelope bass line at the start of Chameleon, bow, 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 bow which progresses beautifully into this funky simmer. Big horn harmony breaks too, as well as these reverb-drenched, trippy intergalactic keyboard solos. The band suddenly breaks into this super fast, groovy, hand-drum-backed uh, jam session before returning to the original theme and bass line of the song. It's quite the odyssey. And again, it's impressive and memorable, uh, both as a composition, uh, but also an exercise in improv, which is why I think this track has been covered and reinvented so many times the world over over by a host of different jam, jazz, and fusion artists, including the String Cheese Incident, Government Mule, and so many more. But yeah, the track is pretty much a standard at this point, which uh, is, is rare for the fusion era, where you, you just generally were not getting a whole lot of uh, what are considered today to be jazz standards. Following this, we have Watermelon Man, which has a, a pretty memorable start to it with all of these uh, calling and responding 2D woodwind melodies, some rustic percussion 
2, uh, which all serves as the spacey and tribal backbone for uh, some beats and some very sleek bass line intervals. Tangy electric keys too. It is the shortest track of the bunch on this album, but it packs the most punch in my opinion in terms of sounding animated and quirky. And maybe there was pressure to go somewhere out there uh, with the track considering that it is a revision of a song Herbie had already released in the early 60s, because outside of its trademark horn harmonies and chord changes, uh, it's nearly unrecognizable. So it just goes to show uh, how far aesthetically jazz had moved and evolved and changed in the 10 years since uh, you know Herbie was kind of originally breaking onto the scene. Then there's Sly, which is the fastest and most intense track of the bunch, not only for its precise staccato horn and drum breaks, which are all over the first leg of the track and sound kind of like a balancing act, to be honest. But then also the insane pace that the track hits once things really start heating up with screaming sax solos and hand percussion flying in every direction. Then Herbie really peppering the groove of the song uh, with these Morse code keyboard hits that are just so tiny, just so miniature. They intensify the groove of the track. They add so much more detail to the groove of the track. The whole thing sounds like the trippiest chase scene you've ever heard in your entire life. The electricity bouncing between everybody playing on this recording uh, cannot be described. And then following this, you have the finishing track of the record Vein Melter, which is really a calm after the storm on the album and the most open, explorative, easygoing track on the record, where Herbie really tests his capacity to uh, capture both uh, beauty and mind-bending oddity between all of these different synths and keyboard patches and effects and uh, weird little tricks that he's pulling off off with his playing. It's not the fiery thrill that the previous tracks on the record offer, but there is a serenity to it that I love and can't deny. And that is just kind of a quick rundown of this amazing, funky, uh, jazzy, iconic record that I think is really one of the most fun albums of the entire jazz canon, uh, and is certainly worth a listen, especially if you're unfamiliar with the genre. And I think that is going to be that. Herbie Hancock, Classic Review, amazing record. Tran, Zishin, have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? You're the best, you're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like, please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head is another video you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Herbie Hancock, Headhunters, uh, forever.